exist. You know zero people on earth, zero, that have made it. You know people that mommy and daddy made it and gave them the money and they're just milking it. But you know zero goddamn people that made it that didn't put in real goddamn work. And so for some reason, and and my friends, let's call a spade a spade because that's far more interesting. This is an interesting model to many of you because you're like, oh, I'm gonna get Rick into my team and Sally and they're gonna work. I'm gonna be in Jamaica and drinking rum chattas. <laughs> Doesn't exist. It's not how it works. Anyway, here's what I did. Jumped into my dad's business from 20 to 30 years old. I worked every day. I opened the store at 7 a.m. I went home at 10 p.m. I didn't hook up with girls. I didn't hang out with dudes. I put my head down and I put in real substantial work. The other thing I did was I was right about where the world was gonna go. I launched a website, that was right. Back when most people thought I should have opened a second liquor store. I started an email newsletter. How many people here have done an email newsletter or done email marketing in their career? Let me just see. Great, hold it up. Ready for this punchline? In 1998, I had 150,000 people on an email newsletter with 91% open rates. Don't clap but thank you. (laughs) It's not because I'm so great, it's because nobody else was doing email marketing and I bought that attention at a low cost because it wasn't a supply and demand issue. We didn't live in the world we live in now that every business spams the living crap out of you. How many people here had email in 1998, 1999? Do you remember how we rolled back then? We read every goddamn email and every word in every email and that's why I did well. And so that chilled for me, I sold a ton of wine. I was competing with people that were send, selling, sending direct mail and catalogs and buying newspaper ads for the wine and I was emailing them, getting it in front of customers weeks and months before the other people and it cost me nothing. And by the way, I was doing direct mail and print and radio as I started building up and I saw the difference between buying attention at a discount or overpaying for attention because it's tried and true and it's what people always did. Next, Google AdWords came along. Google AdWords was super interesting to me. I saw Google, it was winning, it was better than Yahoo, and Ask Jeeves, and all the other crap that was out there back then. I was like, I like Google, Google's good. How many people used Google in the early days? 2000, 2001? Remember good Google, when like, whenever you typed in, the first result was exactly what you were looking for? So that's why Google won for the youngsters in here, and then they created ads. And one thing I know more than anything, More than I know that the sun will come up tomorrow, I know that marketers ruin everything. (laughs) It's what we do. I'm actively enjoying ruining Snapchat as we speak. It's what we do. Take attention, sell against it. But this was early Google. Nobody was ruining it yet. Nobody was doing SEM and things of that nature. And then they came out with an ad product. And I owned the word wine on Google AdWords for five cents a click before they even raised the minimum to 10 cents for nine months before anybody bid me up. That's called day trading attention. I knew that people were on Google and would click the first result if it was an ad or not because it was new and the liquor stores I was competing with didn't even know it existed. And so in a very quick period of time between a website, email marketing, Google AdWords, I was building a real business. And then my career took the substantial turn that got me to the stage today. YouTube came out. And I looked at it, and I was like, huh, this is gonna be big. And so in 2006, less than a year after YouTube had been out, with not one video on YouTube having one million views yet in the world, I started a video blog called Wine Library TV. The premise was, thank you, mom. The premise was, (laughs) the premise was, I sat in my office, at my table, with four bottles of wine, and I drank them. <laughs> and it was 20 minutes long, something that Google and Yahoo flew me out to in 2007 to their companies because they couldn't understand people were watching it because back then everybody thought it had to be five seconds. And hundreds of thousands of people a day started watching that show, five days a week for five years, and it was when I learned about content. Here's the big one for a lot of you, and I'm actually not gonna dig into it. I'm gonna let the smartest people in the room just understand it and leave it at that, because I'm just playing with myself. (laughs) My YouTube show was the 
first time I didn't run advertising. It was the first time I did content. When I got the camera at Best Buy, when I sent somebody to go get it at Best Buy to come back, I thought I was gonna start the QVC of wine. I was gonna sit there and I was gonna sell you wine. I was gonna say, buy this, buy this. Go to the website, call this number, buy this. The camera goes on in the first episode, and if you ever dig it up on YouTube, you'll see it very tame, and because I'm thinking, and I realize, oh my God, this is gonna be on the internet forever. <laughs> and I think this is gonna work. So what happens when this is big in a year or two and I'm at a party or a convention or in the store and somebody comes up to me with a glass of wine and says, hey, taste this, and what do you think? And I taste it and I say it's rubbish and they go, aha, I knew it. You told me to buy it on Wine Library TV. I got scared. I realized the transparency of it all really mattered. And so even if you watch the first episode, you can see my head spinning. And from that day, I realized from day one, episode one, I did a thousand episodes of it, five days a week, five years, I realized I needed to be America's wine guy, not selling you wine. How many people here have a friend or relative that's fairly into wine? Raise your hands. Great. So you guys know what I know, which is the second that anybody gets even just a little bit of wine knowledge, they become a straight douchebag. <laughs> And so, and so the reason my show did well is I talked to people about wine, not down to them. My friends, you're gonna hear a lot of stuff over this week. Content marketing matters. What you do on Periscope and Facebook Live, on Snapchat and Facebook, on Instagram, on emerging things like Musical.ly and Twitter and 14 other things that will happen during your career, they're all gonna matter, right? If you pick the right ones early on and go hard, you can pop and you can really, really win. But if you don't have anything good to say, you will lose even if you're the first person there. It's like Christopher Columbus. The dude that ate the poison berry first, he died, right? Like, you've gotta pick the right thing. And so the punchline here is the following. The content that you're putting out, and I audited a lot of your coaches' content, there wasn't a whole lot of coaching going on. There was a whole lot of selling going on. There was no social. You were pumping out content. People were asking you questions about the products in your Instagram posts and you were nowhere to be seen because you just care about numbers. You care about width, not depth. My friends, it doesn't matter how many Instagram followers you have. It matters how many Instagram followers you have that care. I went on the show, it did great, I did the show, it did great, and then YouTube sells for $1.7 billion to Google, and just so you know, back in 2008, $1.7 billion is like you hearing tomorrow that something was sold for $48 trillion. It was like, <laughs> we couldn't believe it, it was the craziest number I'd ever heard, and that was the moment I said, my God, I was right about e-com, I was right about email, I was right about Google AdWords, I'm right about YouTube, this thing that I have, I can make a lot more money, maybe I don't need to build the biggest wine business in the world to buy the Jets. Maybe this gift of knowing what consumers are gonna do is a thing that I can do. And so instead, when I read the Google articles, I realized people angel invested in it. I'm like, what's angel investing? I Googled angel investing, I read what it was, and I said the next time that I feel that feeling that drove me over the last seven years for all the success that I had, that I was gonna invest. That happened 100 days later when I went to Austin, Texas, to South by Southwest, and everybody was talking about this new app that came out a week earlier called Twitter. Everybody thought it was the stupidest thing they ever heard of because who cares if you're eating pizza or walking the dog. I thought that it was gonna be the next big thing. I met the founders, I invested, I made a video a week later that it was gonna be big. Facebook saw it, Mark Zuckerberg invited me to come out and speak with Dave Morin to Mark Zuckerberg and the team. I spoke, Zucks liked it, we had dinner, I bought stock from his parents, then I knew high school kids were on Tumblr, I invested in that, and the first three investments I ever made in my career were Twitter, Facebook, and 